Baltics. We are reinforcing all of the Baltics and Poland uh, with NATO forces as a deterrent. NATO is quite united. To the world of business. But we are trying to bring something that it is a new version that will cover equally well the old and the new variants, all variants. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome now to Balance of Power. We start again today with Ukraine. As the conflict continues, we hear from the Defense Department that, in fact, Russian troops may be encircling Kharkiv, may be closing on Kharkiv, even as some people continue to search, perhaps, for a diplomatic solution. We turn to our Washington correspondent, Joe Matthew, at the White House. He is, of course, the host of, host of Sound On every day on Bloomberg Radio. So, Joe, bring us up to speed on where things stand with Ukraine. Well, an interesting trip abroad here for Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, David. She was wheels up a few hours ago on the way to Poland and then Romania, where she's going to be meeting with the leaders of those two countries the next two days, along with some other officials, including Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who is in theater right now. This visit comes against the backdrop of not just the advancing troops from Russia you just mentioned, but also a humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in those two countries. More than a million refugees streaming over the border into both Poland and Romania. This is something that they will be discussing when the vice president is in the room with these leaders. But it also comes with a more pressing issue that involves the military, and it's something Bloomberg has reported on extensively the last several days. That's the transfer of MiG-29 fighter jets from Poland to Ukraine. Yesterday, Poland rolled out a plan to send those jets to a Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, from where the U.S. would presumably take them and transfer them to Ukraine. The Pentagon reportedly did not get a heads up on this, and a statement from spokesman John Kirby made clear that they do not favor this option, as there are many concerns here about the way this could be interpreted and whether Russia would see this as an act of war. The German Chancellor Schultz also echoed those remarks this morning. David, these MiG-29s we're talking about are Russian-made supersonic fighter jets, not unlike an American-made F-15. And there are many questions, a lot of uncertainty about where they would fly from, who would refuel them and how they would be rearmed. David? And, and just a moment from now, we're going to actually get to talk with the former Defense Secretary, Mark Esper, about that very issue, the MiG-29s. But in the meantime, there's also some other aid, non-military aid, as I understand, that's been approved. We had an omnibus, an agreement at least, out of the House yesterday. That's right, David, and that number has gone up even since you and I talked about it yesterday. Now in the area of $14 billion in aid for Ukraine, that's going to be part of an omnibus budget that is making its way through Congress right now. They did establish a continuing resolution to buy a couple days, four days if need be, as the lights would go out in the government on Friday night if they don't get this done. So with a little extra breathing room, it's expected that the House and Senate will both approve that money this week, David. Okay, thank you so much to our Washington correspondent, Joe Matthew. Once again, he is the host of Sound On every day of the week at 5 p.m. on Bloomberg Radio. To continue this discussion on Ukraine and to pick up specifically the complexities around the MiG-29 transfer or possible transfer, we welcome now the former Secretary of Defense under President Trump. He's Mark Esper, and he is the author of a book that's coming out in May, May 10, look for it, A Sacred Oath, Memoirs of a Secretary of Defense During Extraordinary Times. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. A lot to talk about, but let's pick up with where Joe Matthews just was. Do you understand, can you explain to us the complexity, actually, even as we've been speaking, we had Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, come out and say that uh, Poland offer on fighter jets raises, quote, complexities. What are the complexities? Do we know? Yeah, well, first of all, David, great to be with you. It's uh, I look forward to our topic uh, today. So let me just say, yes, there are probably a number of complexities. I think, uh, first of all, there's clearly mis miscommunication between Warsaw and Washington that caught the, the folks at the Pentagon and at the White House off guard. Uh, I think they need to take this uh, out of the public uh, purview, if you will, and discuss uh, along with other NATO allies, how, how such a transfer might work. Uh, there is obviously concern that some type of uh, uh, giving these jets to Ukraine might provoke uh, Russia. So that's one issue. The second one is you have to figure out also is where are you going to station these aircraft? And then, of course, you have to get into how do you refuel them? How do you rearm them? How do you maintain them? There are a whole series of questions here to get at uh, the, the provision of these aircraft. That said, I think it's a good idea a far better idea to do this than to impose a no-fly zone. On the other hand, I'd say that, though, that the tragedy that, that is unfolding right now in Ukraine is one of the indiscriminate shelling and bombardment of Ukrainian cities by Russia. And most of that, it appears, 
is not occurring through airstrikes, but through uh, ground-based uh, artillery, cruise missiles, et cetera. So I think what we need to do is figure out a way to tackle that issue. And there have been a number of ideas out there. Uh, obviously, we need to continue to provide the Ukrainians with anti-tank and anti-air missiles. Uh, an idea was floated to provide them with uh, S-300 and S-400, which are Russian-built, medium uh, sized air defense systems, that would be very helpful as well. So there are a number of things we could do on multiple levels to address the indiscriminate bombardment of uh, of Ukrainian cities by the Russians. Uh, let me understand this if I can, Mr. Secretary, is that do you think that supplying aircraft in and of itself is more likely to lead to an escalation or a spreading of this than, for example, air defense systems? Uh, providing the, the MiG-29 aircraft to the Ukraini Ukrainians is less likely to provoke Russia uh, than providing them with uh, S-300 or S-400. Those are Russian-built systems that, that some of our NATO allies currently possess, as I understand it. That's fascinating. L let me ask you the other side of this, because uh, any number of people are still hoping maybe there's some diplomatic solution to this. We actually got to speak with the Deputy Chief of Staff to President Zelensky of Ukraine earlier today, and this is part of what he had to say about pursuing diplomatic alternatives. If you ask me whether there is a diplomatic solution, surely we are ready for the diplomatic solution. You know, there, are, there were three rounds of negotiations already on the level of delegation. Tomorrow, our Minister of Foreign Affairs will meet together with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. But very important that my president is ready to have the direct negotiations with President Putin. From your experience, Mr. Secretary, do you think there may still be a diplomatic path here? And do we have any reason to believe that President Putin, who's calling all the shots here, has any desire for a diplomatic solution? Look, I think we always need to pursue a diplomatic path. I encourage the Ukrainians and Russians to meet. I think the Ukrainians are doing the right thing. But frankly, I think it's theater coming out of Russia, out of Moscow by Putin, to, to kind of somehow change the narrative or reshape the narrative a little bit. I don't think he's going to uh, pursue a diplomatic solution, at least not at this point. You know, we heard yesterday from our, the heads of our intelligence agencies on Capitol Hill that they believe that Putin will double down. I've been saying that for some time now. He's in this fight. He's going to stay in this fight. He can't afford to not seize uh, these Ukrainian cities to try and decapitate uh, the Ukrainian government and to, to get his way. So I think we're in for a long slog. This is going to go several weeks, if not many months. And of course, uh, you, you and I talked a little bit beforehand. This affects not just the security architecture in Europe, and then arguably, of course, out into the Pacific with China. But it's going to affect us economically all around the world, not just uh, energy prices, which have risen dramatically, but also consumer goods, uh, precious metals, et cetera, that I think needs to be taken into account now. And we should start adapting our economy and the Western economy to deal with that. The support that we are providing or should provide uh, to Ukraine, is it large enough to actually impinge upon our supplies here in the United States? We have a viewer actually writing in right now asking this question, saying, do we have enough, whether it's fighter planes or other things, to supply our allies as well as Ukraine, or will it really require us to rethink our defense posture? You know, I, I think, first of all, the supplies provided by the United States and its NATO allies has been has been good, much better than what it was initially. I think the continued provision of anti-air and anti-tank weapons makes sense. We should look at anti-ship missiles, things like counter-battery radar, which would help on the field. And then, of course, intelligence, tactical intelligence to help them do better targeting. So I think all those are good, uh, makes sense. Uh, there was a lot of talk, of course, in Washington, D.C. about increasing the defense budget. It's something that I argued for during my uh, three years in government as Secretary of the Army and then later Secretary of Defense, I think we need that 3 to 5 percent annual real growth in spending. And it's not just to deal with Russia, which I had defined as, uh, as our top um, uh, uh, competitor here when it comes to great power competition, but also China, which is actually the bigger one we need to deal with. So unfortunately, we're in a state of play here where we're now facing off with near peer or peer adversaries that, we're going to, that will be with us for the 21st century. And we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to uh, safeguard our nation's security, but to bolster our democracy and help defend our allies and partners around the world. Mr. Secretary, there's the question of how much money we spend. You just raised that. Maybe we should be spending more of it. I also wonder about how we spend the money. Does this uh, crisis, this war in Ukraine, potentially change how we spend the money? We should be investing in some things more than others? Yes, absolutely. First of all, on the amount, we're spending about 3.2% of GDP, which is far less than what we spent during the Cold War. But uh, And that seems expensive. I know it's probably going to be closer to $800 billion this year, but but the, the price of freedom, is it's not free. It costs. And uh, it's better than losing a war, if you will. So we need to continue to make those investments. But we need to do a whole lot better job 
in those investments. So, uh, for example, I was trying to uh, uh, provide a blueprint for a Navy that could deal with China in the uh, 21st century, uh, put a lot of extra money into our Space Force, which was stood up during my tenure, as well as our cyber, as well as our cyber capabilities. Uh, the Marine Corps is, is reformulating itself. The Air Force is and the Army are both doing a number of things, but we need to accelerate all that. And that takes uh, money from Congress and it takes the authorization from Congress. And I know you, on your lead, and you talked about Congress providing money, but look, we're, we're nearly six months into the new fiscal year and we still don't have a budget for DOD. And that really impacts DOD. And it's just a shame that Congress can't act on time uh, and do what's necessary to safeguard our country. And as you mentioned as well, we may face a government shutdown, which I think is unlikely, but our, we need to do a, a much better job in D.C. in terms of providing for our common defense. I will say that's something we have discussed on this program, the fact we're halfway through the fiscal year and we still don't have a budget for the Department right. of Defense or for any of the rest of the government, for that matter. Uh, so, so finally, right. you mentioned China. There are larger geopolitical issues here. Uh, we heard from the Foreign Minister of China this week saying what the, the United States is trying to do is trying to put together a version of NATO for the Pacific. And I know we have a quad arrangement that I think explicitly is not defense-oriented, but are we trying to put that together? And would it be a bad idea if we did? Did. No, it'd be a great idea if we did. Uh, most of our relationships uh, in the Indo-Pacific right now are bilateral ones between, for example, us and Japan or the United States and Korea, the United States and Australia. But it'd be best if we could knit that all together into a broader network. And of course, you mentioned the Quad, which is the four key countries of uh, Japan, the United States, India and Australia. That's very important, but that's an informal coalition uh, also focused on China. But I think we should knit that together. And, you know, the Chinese often complain that uh, this is all about uh, preventing China's rise or opposing China. Look, it's Chinese that are acting badly on the world stage. They're not following the international rules and norms. They're strong arming neighbors. They're, they're fueling autocracies around the world. And so it, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, he has taken them, uh, China, in a bad direction. And it's just something we're going to have to deal with because they clearly have ambitions to supplant the United States as the global leader by the year 2049. And that's just a fact that we need to deal with. And uh, I, I think uh, that we did a good job. The Biden team has picked up on that. And there is process within D.C. that China is the biggest strategic challenge we face in the 21st century. OK, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. That is Mark Esper, former U.S. Secretary of Defense. And once again, two months from today, as I understand it, we're going to have a sacred oath, his memoir of his time at the Defense Department. Coming up, Republican Congressman from Tennessee, Chuck Fleischman, on the appropriations that we need for, for Ukraine. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and we want to keep you up to date with news from all around the world. And for that, we turn to Mark Crumpton for First Word. David, thank you. Ukraine is open to discussing Russia's demand of neutrality as long as it is given security guarantees. But a top foreign policy aide to President Volodymyr Zelensky told Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo today that does not mean surrendering any land. We are not trading Ukrainian territories, not a single inch. Mr. Zovka added Ukraine is ready for a diplomatic solution. He said preconditions for talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin would be a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Russian troops. Vice President Kamala Harris heads to Poland today to discuss the next steps the U.S. and its allies should take to support Ukraine through military and humanitarian assistance. Vice President Harris will meet with Polish President Andreas Duda and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who will also be in Warsaw. She also plans to meet with embassy staff, refugees from Ukraine, as well as Polish and U.S. service members. The vice president's three-day tour will also take her to Romania. In Hong Kong, the plan to test the entire population for coronavirus this month has been put on hold indefinitely. Instead, the city will prioritize vaccinating the elderly. It also will increase the number of hospital beds to treat patients. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is 
Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. As we've been talking about in this program, Congress is up against a deadline of Friday to get a budget passed to keep the government going. And yesterday, the House side came to agreement, Democrats and Republicans, on a package of about $1.5 trillion. We welcome now Republican Congressman from Tennessee, Chuck Fleischman. He's on the Appropriations Committee, where he is the ranking member of the Homeland Security Subcommittee. So welcome, Congressman. Great to have you here. Take us through this omnibus, Pleasure. as it's called. What is the importance of this bill? The importance of this bill, even though it is late in the fiscal year, is really the miracle that we're probably going to be able to pass all 12 appropriation bills within the big bill. Some years we fail and there are continuing resolutions. Other years, uh, some of the bills pass, the easier ones, the harder ones. Homeland, I've got probably the most difficult one. Uh, don't get passed. This year, we're going to have a comprehensive package getting that done. It's good for defense. It's good for homeland security. Uh, and more importantly, I think our friends in the Senate and the White House are going to join us with this. So we are finally going to get it done better late than never. Uh, we just heard, as you know, from the former Secretary of Defense, uh, Mark Esper, who said that we need to spend more on defense. Is there more for defense in this package? Absolutely. And that's one of the main reasons I'm going to be supporting this bill. This bill, the American people need to know, has defense appropriations higher than the NDAA limits that were set uh, earlier in the legislative year. So it is a robust bill for defense at a time when we dearly and clearly need defense spending. There are also some domestic priorities that our friends on the other side of the aisle wanted in there. Obviously, it's not the bill that I would have drafted, but it's good for the American people. Strong on defense, strong on homeland security. There is actually money in there for the wall. Very pleased about that, $1.9 So uh, Republican priorities have been addressed and are in there. Uh, it's a large bill. And of course, the supplemental for Ukraine, which is dearly needed at this time of war. In that, in that country. I was going to ask about that supplemental, which is, I guess, attached to this package. $13.6 I think I read, it's gotten up to, which was increased from $10 billion. In your judgment, do you think that's going to be enough, and for how long? We don't know if it's going to be enough, but it is sorely needed and immediately needed. Let's face it, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is horrific. It's had direct, very bad consequences. But the short, midterm, and long-term consequences for that country and for the world, we're seeing commodities affected, are staggering. So I think the sooner that we get in there with humanitarian and military aid and help these people, help them defend their sovereignty, and do what the vast majority of the world is doing and saying, look to Russia, to Putin, this is wrong, it's, it's just not the, the right thing to do at this time or ever, we're going to stand with Ukraine. The world is doing that. And more importantly, I think the United States is leading with one unified voice to say no to Ukraine, no to Russia, no to what they're doing in Ukraine, and we'll stand together. Congressman, you mentioned commodities and what is happening with commodities prices. We're watching them just skyrocket, no matter almost yes. what the commodity is. Is there anything the United States can do, Congress, the administration, is there policy that could sort of take some of that sting out of what the American consumer is going to be suffering? Absolutely. I think right away we need to increase domestic energy production. Oil, natural gas, I work very strong in the nuclear sector, but all of the above energy needs to be increased domestically. Uh, one of my several criticisms of this administration has been from the inception with the Keystone Pipeline and other areas, the Biden administration has thwarted, has stopped domestic oil production. That has hurt us. It's put us in a vulnerable position, and that's where we are right now. We need to start today, actually yesterday. We need to start and increase domestic oil production. We have abundant natural resources in this country. We have in West Texas oil fields that dwarf the size of the Saudi oil fields. We have um, the Alaska um, uh, drilling that is available to us. We have it all over the United States. We can actually become an importer again. We need to do that. On the commodity side, obviously, uh, Ukraine produces a lot of agricultural products. It's a world market. We need to get out there and produce more corn, soybeans, uh, wheat. Anything that we can produce in America, we need to do it. We need to do it well. 
Congressman, really appreciate your time. I know you're awfully busy on Capitol Hill these days. That's Republican Congressman Chuck Fleischman of Tennessee. Still to come, we're going to talk with former chair of the Senate Energy Committee, Mary Landro. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Big things are happening on Bloomberg in March. First, Bloomberg Triple Take, breaking down the day's biggest stories. Today's Triple Take focused on the energy transition. Then, the return of Bloomberg ETF IQ. The last major holdouts of the ETF revolution. And the debut of Bloomberg Crypto. The CEO of Binance weighed in. Finally, David Rubenstein brings you insights and advice from the world's greatest investors on a new season of Bloomberg Wealth. All this March, right here on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We've been watching the march closely all week long because of what's going on in Ukraine for a reaction. All right today, we've got stocks up, we've got commodities down. So to explain it all to us, we welcome Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. So what is happening? It seems that we have a pretty strong relief rally in our hands. That S&P 500 right now up 2.6%, the Nasdaq up even more, up 3%. The Nasdaq, or excuse me, the S&P 500 headed to its best day since June of 2020. So that's pretty strong buying. And similar to what we were talking about yesterday, after the announcement of the ban on importing Russian oil, it seemed to sell the news moment because into that, oil had gone up, you know, it had really been going bonkers. I think over in eight days or so, it had been up uh, 33%. But after the, the soft headline, up more than 18%. Right now, we have oil down 6.3%. We have wheat down 6%. We have copper down. So that commodity complex coming in, providing some relief for stocks on the idea that and maybe inflation, it won't be so bad. But we well, do have CPI tomorrow. We do get CPI, exactly. That'll be an interesting discussion, won't it? So, so one day does not a trend make. At the it same certainly time, does not. the tenure is up over 1.9. So it doesn't look like people are too anxious at the moment. Well, I'm so glad that you're always keeping an eye on bonds because we've been talking about this over the last couple of days. Even while stocks yesterday, hugely volatile, up and down more than 1% the day before a sell off as commodities were surging for the most part, bonds the whole time selling off. So that tells you that some investors are not all that worried and that they weren't really focused on the headlines or, sadly, that humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, they're thinking about next week, the Fed. What will the Fed do? Right now, traders thinking that at least one hike is going to happen. What if there's a surprise of two? Yeah, that was a real possibility a month ago. I'm it not sure it is today. But Even just be, two weeks ago, it was a real possibility. And that CPI number tomorrow is going to be Critical. tied to Fed in all likelihood. Definitely. That CPI number will be hugely watched. It could be really a game changer for markets. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Coming up, economist Sarah House of Wells Fargo on inflation and on the Fed. We're going to be talking with her about what we should expect next week. This is Balance of Power. We're on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Now, we want to keep you up to date with all the news from right around the world. And for that, we turn to Mark Crumpton with First Word. David, thank you. The former CEO of Russia's Yukos Oil says the country has moved from an authoritarian regime to a totalitarian. In an exclusive interview, Mikhail Khodorkovsky told Bloomberg's Amory Hordern that change is coming to Moscow. The regime will change, no doubt about it. Before, it might have taken 10 or 20 years from now. But now, it may happen much faster. Khodorkovsky also said that all of Russia's oligarchs should be targeted by sanctions. The House of Representatives is set to vote today on a long-delayed $1.5 trillion spending bill that would fund the U.S. government through the rest of the fiscal year. The measure would also provide $13.5 billion to respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. To pass the bill, House Democrats have set up separate votes on the defense-related and domestic portions because progressives are refusing to back the defense increase and Republican votes will be needed. Germany has emerged as the main roadblock to broaden European Union sanctions against Russia. According to documents seen by Bloomberg, Berlin is resisting efforts to expand the list of Russian financial institutions cut off from SWIFT, the bank messaging system behind much of global trade. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has also publicly called for restraint on sanctions that could impact energy. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, tomorrow is the day when we get CPI numbers for the month of February, much looked at, particularly by the Fed, as we go into that Fed meeting next week. And to take us through what we're expecting on CPI, and for that matter, the Fed as well, we welcome now Sarah House. She's Wells Fargo's senior economist. Thank you so much for being with us, Sarah. Start with CPI. What are you thinking about? We're hearing some really high numbers. Right, so we're actually a little bit below consensus. So we're looking for a headline increase of 0.7%. But just because that's below consensus doesn't mean that it is not still another scorching hot print. So by our estimates, that pushes CPI up to 7.8% over the past year. And so still not seeing any meaningful relief at all on the inflation side for consumers or, for, or the Fed for that matter. So, so let's be clear. This is month, uh, month of February numbers. Will this reflect at all what's happened since the invasion of Ukraine? Because we're seeing a lot of prices go up, particularly for commodities. Right. So it'll be reflected to some extent. So the BLS does sample things like gasoline prices throughout the month. So it is a monthly average. So it'll capture that increase we saw in the last week of the month. But it's not going to be nearly as high as what we think we'll get for March following the rapid rise that we've seen in oil and gasoline prices. So really, this is just the warm up to what's likely to be a, another blazing hot CPI print for March. Well, and it really raises the question. We heard from a lot of economists that we would get uh, inflation, would continue to grow, but it should be peaking right about now or even maybe in February, start coming down. Given what we're seeing right now, what do you expect in terms of a peak for inflation? How far out is that likely to be? Right. So we were expecting inflation to peak in February before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but that's gone out the window. So right now, I think it really hinges on what happens to oil over the next few months given how quickly that that feeds through to inflation. And so right now you're probably looking somewhere at March, April, but it really depends on your assumptions about oil and how quickly that rises and whether it stays at those prices. Okay, so that takes us to the really important question of the Fed next week. Uh, they've got a tough mm -hmm. job. They had a tough job, I, I think most people thought, before Ukraine happened, because trying to really take some of the heat off of inflation is never easy for a central bank. What do you expect out of the Fed next week? for the Fed to go ahead with a 25 basis point increase. So we think when we step back and look at the impact of these higher commodity prices, so yes, it's going to be a hit to growth, but it's also, of course, going to push not only headline inflation higher, but also core to some extent. And really, if you look at where growth is and where inflation is, inflation is much wider of the mark of, of where the Fed would like it to be. We have some scope for growth to come down and still remain at relatively healthy rates. And so I think the Fed's going to keep its, its eye on the target of bringing down inflation over uh, closer to its mandate. And so we still think that we're, we're, on, we're on pace for a tightening cycle over the next few months. Uh, and are the markets prepared for this, do you think? I think they are, if you look at where markets are, are pricing. So they are pricing a, a rate hike, not just in March, but roughly, roughly six hikes this year. And so I think they're, they're still attuned to that. So I don't think it'll be a surprise uh, at this point. You, you mentioned that in all likelihood, uh, we're going to have some reduction in growth, in GDP growth. What are you projecting in terms of what's happening with Ukraine and more generally in, uh, on growth? Well, so in terms of, of the U.S., it really comes down to that inflationary impact and, and what it does to consumer spending, what it does to, to production costs. So we think oil prices at these levels, so it's equivalent to roughly a half a percentage point off of growth. Now, we're coming into this period expecting GDP growth of, of essentially 3.5% this year. So still... You know, we're not we're not talking recession by by any means. Again, there is some scope for for GDP growth to slow before we we get really into a trouble spot, and so that's going to keep the Fed focused on bringing down inflation. So, sorry, I'm really curious about this. As an economist, uh, you have projections that you have been making for the years. You just said uh, for growth. Uh, Ukraine happens. Uh, do you know enough to really adjust those projections, or do you have to wait and see? You have to put in various assumptions. So there's different scenarios that you can come up with. 
but I think each forecast is contingent on a certain set of assumptions. And so that's something very important for market participants, policy analysts to, to bear in mind when looking at these economic forecasts is what do we expect to happen with oil prices? How is that contingent on what sort of sanctions we might see, whether it's businesses self-sanctioning or wider government sanctions? And so it all comes down to what assumptions you're making because the, the actual situation is of course still evolving. So as we look at gas prices right now, obviously all of us across the country are looking at gas prices really going to numbers we've never seen before. But not just that, wheat as well going really skyrocketing. It's going to be expressed in the cost of foods. At what point in the economy do you start to see demand destruction? We're getting to the point where we're getting close. So this situation is a little bit trickier if you think about the fact that households, they do have that excess savings. There's a lot of pent up for travel. So from a pure gasoline perspective, maybe you wouldn't see as much demand destruction at these prices as, as we would previously. But you have to offset that with the fact that we're seeing a broad increase in prices. So it isn't just gasoline rising. So we already have food inflation at the highest levels in 40 years. And that's before we really start to see the effects of these higher agricultural commodities begin to feed into to what we're paying at, at the grocery store. So I think really in, in terms of, of the environment that we're looking at ahead, it is going to, to weigh heavily on, on demand. So let's look for a little good news, if I can try to find it here. And that is this, the state of the consumer, the household uh, uh, balance sheet, because we'd had a lot of money put into the economy and specifically going to the balance sheet of households. Uh, how much momentum was there already and how much capacity is there for consumers to absorb some of these increased prices because they haven't borrowed as much? Well, that's the big question is, is how much will consumers spend down those excess savings? So in January, when we saw income growth stall, we saw only about a 30 billion dip from the peak of excess savings. So households have barely touched that, that cash pile. And we've also seen balance sheets increase uh, tremendously. And so when you think of households' ability to spend on future pur purchases rather than paying off past purchases, it's still very strong. So again, this isn't necessarily your, your typical uh, demand, your typical um, shock from higher commodity prices, um, denting demand to the same extent we've seen in, in previous periods. There's a lot of moving pieces. And finally, Sarah, we are just, we believe, we hope, are coming off of that Omicron wave uh, with the numbers really going na down that. Do we still have some momentum to come from the reopening or the re-reopening or the re-reopening? I think you certainly do. So that's a big factor driving our expectations for consumer spending this year. It's really all being driven by services. And we're also seeing that in, in inflation as well. So not just housing, but other services still have a lot more scope for, for price gains as that demand comes back stronger. So it's not all doom and gloom out there. There's certainly pockets of, of strength. Good. We'd like to end a little bit of a positive note. Thank you so much to Sarah House. She's Wells Fargo's senior economist. Coming up, former chair of the Senate Energy Committee, Mary Landro, and we're going to talk to her about what's going on in the energy markets. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We have a bit of breaking news right now just across the Bloomberg. We now have oil prices down at more than 10 percent, apparently on that news that Ukraine may, may be willing to talk about a compromise with Russia, which was covered in part with an interview on Bloomberg right here with the deputy chief of staff to President Zelensky. So staying on that subject of what's going on in the energy markets, we welcome now the former chair of the Senate Energy Committee. She's Mary Landrieu. She now serves on the Leadership Council of Natural Allies for a Clean energy future. So, Senator, thank you so much for being with us. I know you're down at Sarah. Give us a sense of what is being talked about down there, as I say, right now that's come off the top. Well, David, there's a, a lot of buzz and excitement. Um, there's a lot of energy, no pun intended, here at Sierra Week. Uh, Secretary Kerry spoke earlier, Secretary Granholm speaking in just a minute, Secretary Moniz, the former secretary is here, the leadership of the industry. But it's exciting to think about what the industry is thinking about for the future, particularly when it comes to natural gas, leading and accelerating our climate 
goals for the future and serving as a partner with solar and wind and other renewables. Uh, this is not your grandfather's oil and gas industry. These folks here, these energy leaders, these industry leaders, these pipeline builders and contractors are all talking about the future and very concerned as you are and as we all are about what's happening in Europe and this invasion of the Ukraine, the disruption to the oil markets, and the vulnerability that Europe has shown relying on Russia. And the U.S. has the resources, David. We have the natural gas. We have it in abundance, and it's clean, and it can be used to accelerate our climate goals, working with our renewables, and keeping jobs here in America. So there's a tremendous amount of good work that's happening right here in Houston today. And, and I know the organization you're associated with now, the Natural An Allies for a Clean Energy Future, are really involved in natural gas. I guess one of the questions we have right now, given what's going on, is how fast can we ramp it up? Well, the industry is very, very good at um, when they're given the right signals from governments, local, state, and mostly federal. We have a lot of resources in the ground, both onshore, offshore, private lands, public lands, deep water gas in the Gulf of Mexico that we can get. But we need the permits, we need the signal, and we need the federal government to say we want to be a partner, not an enemy to the industry, but a partner to the industry to provide the kind of um, fuel that America America needs to grow and prosper and be safe. And, you know, we've been focused, I think, David, too much on the fuel and not on the emissions. It's not fossil fuels that are the problem. It's the emissions from fossil fuels. And that's what the Natural Allies Coalition is all about. We want to get methane leakage down or eliminated. We want to make sure that we use natural gas so you know, sort of in the transition to hydrogen, which can fund a lot of our industrial base. So we want wind, solar, hydro, nuclear, and natural gas as that foundation. That's what happened to Europe. They don't have the resource that we have. Then they shut down their nuclear power plants. They closed their coal power plants. And then, you know, Putin invaded the Ukraine. And everybody's wondering why they're paying 10 times the price in Europe that we're paying here. So Americans are knowing this, I think. And that's what our new polling shows. So I hope you'll share that with your, your, your viewers. President Biden, in coming in, uh, really was very aggressive on climate goals. And some people in the oil and gas industry heard that as discouraging fossil fuels. He was really going after them. Are you hearing a different tune these days? I know, for example, Secretary Granholm was down there in Houston with you at SARA. Is the, is the Biden administration changing their position? I wouldn't say they're changing their position, but they're modifying it and their tone is more appropriately friendly. This industry wants to be a partner, and many, many, many people in this industry, pipelines, producers, midstream operators, industrials, believe that they can be part of a clean energy future. And that's not just baloney. I mean, this is what people are talking about here. It's not your grandfather's oil and gas industry. You know, we have Williams Company, for instance, leading this Natural Allies Coalition, labor unions are part of it. They understand, like Joe Biden does, that we want to create jobs here in America. America. And this asset that we have, natural gas, can be a foundation to accelerate our clean energy future. And I mean it. And not have us relying on anyone but ourselves. We have enough to supply ourselves, David. We have enough to send gas to Poland, to Finland, to Germany. Now, we can't do it overnight. But there are permits sitting on people's desk in Washington that need to move. And financing needs to be given a signal. There's plenty of private money. This isn't about government money subsidy for an industry. Private money is ready to take on this challenge, and America can lead. So this is the, a great place to be. There's a lot of talk about the future, not the past, about change, about innovation, about technology. And we just thank Joe Manchin for his leadership on this issue as chair of the committee, because he's leading the charge in Washington, all of the above, and being serious about it. So let me ask you, as, as someone who has been a policymaker and a decision maker in Washington, there are various ways we could address the issue of really a reduction in the supply of oil and natural gas. One of them is self-sufficiency, as you talk about. Another is to expand the production from overseas. And two are talking about Venezuela, Iran. And there's a report in the Wall Street Journal today, I don't know if it's true or not, but the Wall Street Journal is saying that there's a problem with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, that they really aren't playing ball with us, that we should try to get them to supply more. Should we be pursuing that as well? 
Well, listen, the president has to make those decisions about whether he's going to call Venezuela or Iran or talk to Saudi Arabia. But you know what? He could call Houston. He could call Homa. He could call Midland, Texas. He could call Tulsa, Oklahoma. This industry is ready to work with this administration to move our climate goals forward, to meet those climate goals. But we are going to do it with a truly all and above strategy, proper investments and permitting. Like Mr. Williams was on television yesterday and he said this. It's like it only takes nine months to build a pipeline, but it takes five years to get the permit. Americans know how to build things. Our labor unions are ready to go to work. Our men and women are ready to go to work building these pipelines, our transmission lines for in, in, you know an, an improved grid. Yeah. But we don't have to fight about the fuels. We need to organize and cooperate, and that's what Natural Allies is about. And it's not about giving up our climate goals. It's accelerating them and keeping ourselves energy self-sufficient in our own country, and we can then help our democratic allies around the world. So, Senator, let me try to be a little more specific. You said it can't happen overnight, but it can happen. Between overnight and five years from now, if you could get the permits, I understand that would take some effort, but let's assume you get the permits. How fast could we get to a position where we really were comfortable with the supply we had for the United States, but also that we could even export, as you said, maybe even to Poland? Well, of course, you know, I represent Venture Global, and I can say this, they built their plan in a record 29 uh, months in Louisiana. They're exporting gas to Poland uh, and to Europe as we speak. Uh, they did it in extra fast time, but there are other companies that can build quickly as well. But that is not the solution. I don't want to give people false hope. It's going to take a decade or two, but we need to start now. We should have started you know, 20 years ago. And so that is what we have to do. And, and we'll never be able to supply all the energy needs for the world out of America, of course, but we can strengthen ourselves with our Canadian partners, with Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico, which is overlooked and a great resource for us. And we continue our expansion of solar and wind, natural gas as a foundation, nuclear, you know, nobody wants to talk about that. And I know we have issues with, you know, enriched uranium being, unfortunately, in Russia. So that's an issue we've right. got to figure out. But America can do this. So that's our message here at Sierra Week. It's been exciting to be here all week to see these industry leaders coming together and uh, yeah. talking about jobs and future for the U.S. And it's very helpful to hear that message. Thank you so much, Senator. That's Mary Landro. Thank She's former so chair of the Senate Energy Committee and co-chair of the Leadership Council for Natural Al Allies for a Clean Energy future. I'm going to stay on the subject of energy right now. We welcome back Abigail Blue, <laughs> Abigail Doolittle because we have been talking about the fact that oil prices have been coming down even more. Uh, yes, right now we have oil near session lows down about 10.5 percent. Of course, this on the very positive uh, headline, or I would think it's a positive headline, that uh, Ukraine saying that they're ready to compromise, uh, which is very uh, hopeful. And we don't know about Vladimir Putin, obviously, but at least one side, it seems as though uh, maybe something positive is happening here. Now, on the idea that perhaps the bans on uh, Russian oil uh, and that there's not going to be a supply issue to such a degree around um, this crisis, oil has come down. But you can also just say that oil should never have gone up as much as it did. It was fearful buying, uh, lack of liquidity. And so you, now you're really seeing a pretty strong reversal of it all. WTI crude is currently at about 110 barrels. $110 per barrel. Yeah, it's funny. It sort of looking up. And in fairness, you were saying that you thought it had gone up too far and it might well come back down. Well, when you take a look at any chart and if it goes straight up yeah. physics, a 90 degree angle cannot hold. And we've seen it so many times. Gold, silver. The only market that I've never seen it reverse back down, interestingly enough, is Tesla. But any other market, when you see a parabolic uptrend, it tends to reverse completely. At the same time, we have to keep some perspective here. We're saying, boy, it's down 10%. Uh, Brent is still $113 a barrel. Uh, 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 West Texas Intermediate Crude is still $110 a barrel. You know, uh, uh, six months ago, if you said this was possible, you would think it was insane. Two years ago, it was negative. Well, people uh, uh, agreed. That I, well, it's interesting, actually, because oil right now, having it, at one point, it was having its best day uh, since April of 2020, or excuse me, its worst day since April of 2020 when we had uh, that horrific sell-off. But right now, I think the idea is it's collapsing back down on itself. If you take a look at the charts, you're going to see an absolute reversal of the trend. So the question is, how far does it reverse? It probably does not stop here at 110. It could probably go back below 100. Oh. You could even make the case it goes significantly lower. One of the guests that joined 
joins us frequently in the afternoon, Carly right. Garner of DeCarlyTrading.com, who specializes in commodities and uh, options. She has thought for a while it could go, even with this kind of a spike, somewhere below 70. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Abigail, for coming back on that. That's Abigail Doolittle reporting on oil. We talked earlier today with Sam Zell of Equity Group Investors, and we talked to him about inflation and what the Fed should do about it. Getting inflation back under control has to start with stopping flooding the market with capital. I mean, the degree to which, I mean, you know, we used to talk about, you know, legislation that amounted to adding billions to the liquidity. Now we're talking in trillions. Um, I think that COVID was a very, very much of a challenge, but I think we responded to COVID by doubling down and, and creating levels of liquidity uh, that had to create inflation. I can't imagine that anybody who's an observer of what's going on could possibly be surprised at the inflation numbers when, in effect, you were giving everybody $300 a month for every child, you were, uh, you know, doing PPAs, I mean, you're doing all these different things to create staggering amounts of liquidity into the system. And I think we're starting to see the impact of that, not only in inflation, but in number of people quitting jobs, et cetera. We have to recover from doing that. So as you suggest, it was liquidity both on the monetary side and the fiscal side, and simultaneously to some degree. So what can we do now uh, as a practical matter? What should well, the Fed do right now? I think the Fed should stop buying securities. $80 billion a month of added liquidity by it buying securities. I think it should stop buying securities. I think we need to raise interest rates. I think we probably could raise interest rates 200 basis points uh, over a couple year period uh, and have little or no impact. Uh, there's a lot to be said for the fact that uh, having extraordinarily low interest rates or free money uh, instead of being an incentive uh, is an incentive the other way and, uh, and destroys the sense of urgency. And in, in, a, in a capitalistic system, we need a sense of urgency to encourage people to take risk and make decisions. That was Sam Zell. He's Equity Group Investors founder and chairman. We want to wrap up today talking once again about oil prices because they are down more than 10 percent, both WTI crude as well as Brent crude, down 12 and 14 percent respectively on that news that perhaps Ukraine is open to a compromise. In the meantime, we're going to have a second hour of Balance of Power over on Bloomberg Radio, and we're going to be talking about the Penn Wharton budget model and what it says about the effects of inflation on real wages. And this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.